Mark Gober here, host of the podcast, Where Is My Mind? This is a really, really important interview. It's with Dr. Bruce Grayson, who is a professor emeritus of psychiatry and neurobehavioral sciences at the University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies. Have you ever heard the theory that near-death experiences are just hallucinations? In other words, when the brain is close to death, it starts creating hallucinations, and that's why people report all kinds of visions in the near-death experience? Well, if you think that these are just hallucinations, then you really need to listen to Dr. Grayson. He spent years examining near-death experiences and concludes that they are not hallucinations. In other words, the near-death experience might be an example where consciousness is functioning without a brain. In this interview, we talked about some of the key points. If you'd like to find out more, check out the show notes at markgober.com slash podcast. Enjoy. Maybe you can start with your background and how you became interested in near-death experiences and phenomena along those lines. Hmm. Well, I studied psychology as an undergraduate uh, at Cornell University and got my first exposure there to unusual things that happen to people, mental things that happen. Um, and largely because of that, I went to medical school um, and became a psychiatrist, really to learn more about uh, the strange things that go on in people's minds and the unusual experiences people have. At that time, I was quite firmly in the materialist camp and thought all this was created by the brain and my reason for going into psychiatry was to figure out how the brain uh, makes you think and perceive all these unusual things, which obviously can't be true. Uh, well, um, I found out they are true. Um, and through a variety of experiences, I uh, encountered people who could do things that seemed to be impossible, who could um, know about things going on elsewhere, who could get information from what seemed to be deceased people that was accurate um, and things that I didn't have an explanation for. Uh, so I just filed them away in the back of my mind and thought, I'll have to look into these someday. And then in uh, 1975, um, I was teaching psychiatry at the University of Virginia, and one of the interns starting there under me was a guy named Raymond Moody, who had written a book called Life After Life, in which he described about 50 cases of near-death experiences and gave them a name. Uh, there previously had been no name for this phenomenon in the English language. Uh, people have been talking about it in Europe, but not here in the United States. There had been um, occasional reports of near-death experiences in the medical literature before this, but they didn't have a name, so they were called other things like out-of-body experiences or deathbed visions or apparitions, but there was no overall concept of a near-death experience. So I was introduced to NDEs or near-death experiences by Raymond Moody, as so many other people were. Um, and when he wrote his book, he was sort of overwhelmed by people writing to him. And being an intern, he didn't really have time to deal with those. So he came to me, I you know, was one of his supervisors, and he said, you want to take a look at this stuff? So I started looking, reading his letters, and almost every one was written by someone who had had an NDE and was astounded to learn that they were not the only one that's ever happened to. And they were quite relieved to learn that it didn't make them crazy. So I pursued that, and uh, here it is uh, 40 years later. I'm still trying to learn what these things are all about. What has your research taught you about the relationship between brain activity and the experiences that people report in these NDEs? Uh, that's a very interesting question because there are things that people report that do not seem possible uh, based on, on brain function. Um, for some NDEs, the brain is demonstrably, quote, offline. It's not functioning very well. And that's not true of all NDEs. Uh, some happen when people are thinking they are going to die. For example, when they're in a car accident and they see, see no way out, or when they're falling from great heights and are sure they're going to die, but they end up not dying and not having their brains go offline uh, for any any reason that we're aware of. But there are a number of people who do have 
um, cardiac arrests or under deep anesthesia where their brains clearly are not functioning. Um, and yet, in their NDEs, their thoughts are faster and clearer than ever before. Uh, they are uh, seeing and hearing things that they had never heard before. They have intense emotions, feelings of peace and joy. Um, they will have all sorts of elaborate experiences encountering other entities that seem to be deceased loved ones, that seem to be deities or godlike figures. They tend to relive, relive their entire lives in a flash of a second. They feel themselves leaving their physical bodies and can often look down and see their bodies and report later accurately what was going on at the time. And none of this should be possible with a brain that isn't functioning well. So we're left with this paradox that at a time when the brain isn't functioning, the mind is functioning better than ever. And that's something that the materialist conception that the mind is what the brain does just cannot accommodate. How do we know that the brain is not functioning in these cases? Well, obviously, when someone is having a near-death experience, uh, you're not going to slap 128 electrodes on their head and look at what's going on in the brain. But people have done that with patients who are having cardiac arrest and having a variety of other uh, near-death events uh, that are similar to NDEs. And we know what happens in those cases. We know what happens in deep anesthesia. We know what happens when the heart stops. And within a matter of seconds, um, the the brain waves decrease and flatline in about 12 seconds with a cardiac arrest. So we know that there is not much, if any, electrical activity going on in the brain at that time. So what is the, the, the typical response from the, the scientific community to these types of experiences if there's clearly no brain function? Well, interestingly, it's changed over the decades I've been doing this. Um, when we first started talking about this at medical conferences back in the early 1980s, um, there was polite silence when we talked about it. Uh, occasionally, there would be some um, comments pro and con, but nobody really said much about it. However, in the intervening decades, there's been so much publicity about this, uh, and it's um, I mean, even Homer Simpson's had a near-death experience now. Everyone knows about them. So that now when we talk at medical conferences, uh, people are very receptive. And in fact, it's common to have doctors in the audience stand up and tell about their near-death experiences or their experiences with patients of theirs who have had NDEs. So I think most physicians now accept that these things really happen. Of course, there's still a lot of controversy about the explanation for them, why they happen. And there are still many, many physicians, as there are many neuroscientists, who still want to believe that there's a way you can explain this on the basis of brain function. And I respect that perspective. I just don't know what that could possibly be. So a few types of explanations I've heard. I'd love to get your thoughts on them. Things like carbon dioxide, oxygen, DMT. What are your thoughts on some of these physiological types of explanations. Right, right. Well, one of the first ones that was proposed was a lack of, of oxygen to the brain uh, because no matter how you come close to death, one of the final things that happens is that you stop getting blood flow and therefore oxygen to the brain, uh, which stops it from functioning. One of the problems with using that as a model is that we know quite well what happens when you have lack of oxygen going to the brain. And what happens is you get very frightened, very agitated, if you're still able to move around, you get very belligerent. You have confused, chaotic hallucinations. And it's very much unlike the typical calm, coherent visions in a near-death experience. Furthermore, there have been several studies now that are done here in the United States and in the United Kingdom where people have actually measured um, the oxygen level in the brain while people are undergoing cardiac arrest. And they have found, contrary to the oxygen model, that people who have lower oxygen in their brain tend to report fewer near-death experiences, not more. So it appears that cutting back the oxygen to the brain makes it less likely that you will report an NDE, not more likely. 
there's a similar situation with the carbon dioxide theory. You know, as you uh, st- stop breathing, you get less and less oxygen to the brain and more and more built up of carbon dioxide. And there was a theory that maybe the buildup of carbon dioxide um, in the brain can cause NDEs. Again, there have been studies in Holland, in the UK, and here showing that um, carbon dioxide does not correlate with near-death experiences, that people who have buildup of carbon dioxide tend not to report NDEs. So although those are appealing hypotheses in terms of they're making logical sense, the data don't bear them out. They contradict those theories. And I think that's what we find in virtually all the physiological theories that have been proposed. There was one theory that this is due to, the NDEs were due to an abnormal temporal lobe stimulation. And we have done studies, we've done studies at the University of Virginia, where I am, we've actually interviewed people who have different types of seizures. And we do not find that the temporal lobe is associated in any way with near-death experiences or out-of-body experiences. There was also a theory that this was due to essentially dream activity intruding into your waking life, uh, so-called REM activity, rapid eye movement activity. Um, And what we found, again, is that the data contradict that theory, that people who are being given anesthetics that reduce uh, dream activity, reduce REM activity, um, tend to have uh, a higher instance of near-death experiences. So although these physiological explanations have some appeal in that they're based on some reasonable analogies, the data contradict them in every case. What about the relationship between some psychedelic experiences and what's reported in NDEs? Do you think there's a relationship? That's a very interesting question. Um, DMT is not the best model since most DMT uh, trips tend to be frightening, but there are some DMT trips that have features comparable to NDEs. And certainly people have reported NDE-like imagery in psilocybin, in LSD, in a variety of psychedelic substances. Um, I would say that the near-death event, coming close to death, is the most reliable way of having a near-death experience. But it's not the only way of having a spiritual experience like this. And psychedelic drugs seem to be one pathway to that for some people. Uh, not for all. Some Many people do not have an experience like that when they take psychedelic drugs, but some do. The question is, how do you interpret that? Um, one of the uh, um, champions of the, the psychedelic experience as a model for NDEs actually had an NDE himself, a spontaneous one, when his heart stopped. And having done that, um, he wrote an interesting paper saying that He no longer believes the psychedelic drugs caused an NDE-like experience. Now, having had one, he believes what the psychedelic drug does is open you up to the NDE. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence now, um, again, from uh, the U.S. studies done at Johns Hopkins University and studies done in in England in the um, Imperial College in London that show that if you look at brain function, when people are given either LSD or psilocybin or ayahuasca, what you see is not the brain being stimulated, but the brain being slowly shut down. And what this suggests is that the drugs are not causing the experience, but the drugs are shutting down some filter that normally in the brain stops you from having these spiritual experiences. Do you think it's possible that some NDEers are making up the story, not necessarily intentionally, but because they've been, they've heard about near-death experiences through other means before having had their NDE? That's a great question. Um, And there are some pieces of evidence that argue against that. One is that people from all over the world, different cultures, report the same types of NDE, no matter what their religious background or culture tells them is going to happen. In addition, Um, We have at University of Virginia a collection of NDEs that we um, gathered from people in the decades before Raymond Moody wrote his book telling people what an NDE was. 
So no one at that point in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 60s had any idea what an NDE was supposed to be like. And we've compared those early accounts we've collected with ones we've accounted we've collected now. And there is no difference. People who had NDEs before anyone knew what they were supposed to be like reported the exact same things that people report now. Now, it doesn't say that nobody can make one up. Of course, you can make you can make anything up. Um, but what it says is that there are legitimate near-death experiences that happen to people that didn't know anything about NDEs. To what extent are there cultural differences um, or d differences in the descriptions of NDEs, and are they biased by someone's upbringing? Uh, that's another great question. What you look, what you find is, if you look at the raw phenomena of NDEs, lights, tunnels, life review, uh, encountering deceased entities, those phenomena do not change either across the globe, different cultures, or across the centuries. We have accounts from ancient Greece and Rome that sound like they could have been, could have been recorded yesterday. Um, and we have culture, we have reports from all the cultures are, that have been studied so far, uh, in, in the Far East, in Africa, in the Pacific, as well as accounts collected from indigenous peoples. Um, French fur trappers in the 1700s were collecting these cases from Indians they came across. There have been studies collected from uh, Australian aborigines that are basically the same as the NDEs that you or I could have. Now, where the cultural conditioning comes in is how you describe that experience. For example, the tunnel, which is very common in NDEs, people reported going through a long, dark structure in order to get from this realm to the other world. People in the United States often call that a tunnel. People in cultures where there aren't a whole lot of tunnels, uh, primitive cultures, do not use that term. They may say they went to a cave. Um, one person that I interviewed here, who was a truck driver, talked about going into a tailpipe. So your personal and religious and cultural upbringing will give you the words to describe the phenomena, but they don't determine what you're going to experience. Another example is uh, people will often report encountering a warm, loving being of light. And many Americans will just call it that, a uh, being of light. But some who are raised, say, in a Christian tradition, may identify that as Jesus or as Mary, uh, whereas people who are raised in other cultures would not do that. So the culture determines what metaphors you use to describe what you experience. And that should not be surprising because most near-death experiencers say, there are no words to describe what happened to me. And yet we force them to tell us about it. So in a sense, we're forcing them to distort the experience by putting it into words. And they will use whatever words their cultural background has taught them to use. You've mentioned the life review a few times. I'd love to talk a bit more about what that is and, and how it's reported. And also whether that phenomenon is reported in any other areas uh, of whether it's psychedelics or other types of experiences where a life review is seen. Yeah, the life review is, is variable. It doesn't happen to everybody in an NDE, uh, but it does happen often. Um, it tends to happen when the near-death experience is sudden and unexpected. For example, uh, an unexpected heart attack or an accident. It tends to happen less often in people who have been anticipating death. For example, people who have a long-term cancer uh, that eventually kills them, or people who are uh, attempting suicide, um, or people who are in combat situations. If you anticipate dying, you're less likely to have the life review. And the way I understand that is that as you are approaching death, you tend to kind of sum up your life. What has been, what's been good? What's been bad in my life? Uh, what would I have liked to have done differently? And if you're anticipating your death over a period of time, you might tend to do that mental work before you have the near death event. So that when you actually have an NDE, that work's already been done. And you only go through the life review 
when you are surprised by coming close to death. Now, I don't have evidence for that. That's just a speculation. Uh, we do know that, that NDEs that are sudden and unexpected tend to have more life reviews, but we don't really know why. But often the life review is more than just reliving your own life from your perspective. In some cases, and we have some very vivid examples of this, the person having the experience will relive events from their life from someone someone else's perspective. For example, one woman that I uh, that I know quite well um, had an, a, a, she was abused uh, by her mother in childhood, and in her life review, she experienced that from her mother's perspective, and came away from her near death experiencing, saying to herself, "No wonder she was like that." She had no choice. That's what she was had to do because of the way she was raised. Another example is a fellow who had been a, a, a wild and aggressive teenager. And at one point he got in a fist fight with someone else and merely, nearly beat the person to death. And when he had his near death experience some 15 years later, he relived that fight from the perspective of the person he was beating up, feeling each one of the blows on his head. Um, so that's kind of thing, a thing you would not expect from just um, intentionally reliving your life, this perspective from the other person's point of view. Do, you, do we see life reviews anywhere else other than in NDEs? Uh, you certainly can. It's not common in other spiritual experiences. And I think that's because the, um, the threat of death is part of what stimulates uh, the life review. Yeah, I, have, I haven't seen as many of those reports outside of the NDE, and I, to me, that's one of the more compelling arguments against many of the physiological arguments, which there are, right. there are many of them. But in, in you know, carbon dioxide, for example, levels of carbon dioxide are not what's what seem to be causing life reviews elsewhere. Is that right? Right, right. Yeah. That's right. And yet the yet the life review is seen in NDEs often. So to isolate carbon dioxide or oxygen or something. Yeah. Yeah. seems to be missing it. Well, the, the things that are most impressive to me in terms of arguing against the physiological uh, explanation is that there are things that just can't be explained in a materialistic framework. People who claim to leave their bodies during the NDE and can report seeing things accurately from some other perspective. Uh, for example, there was one person I, I know quite well who, in the middle of open heart surgery when he was fully anesthetized, left his body and looked down at the resuscitation, at the operation, and saw his surgeon, as he described it, flapping his arms as if he was trying to fly. Now, I've been a doctor for 40 years. I've never heard or seen anyone do something like that. Um, but the patient described that to me. And as a result of that, I went to talk to his surgeon. And the surgeon, in a very embarrassed manner, confessed to me, yes, he does that. That's one of his habits. And what, what this explanation was is he lets his assistants start the surgery, and then he enters the operating room with his hands scrubbed and sterile, and he doesn't want to risk touching something that's not sterile with his hands. So he places them in his armpits and then supervises his assistants by wiggling his elbows to point out where they should cut or where they should pull this or that. So it looks to someone who doesn't know what's going on as if he's flapping his wings as if trying to fly. Now, how could the patient have known this unless he was actually watching it from some other perspective? And there are many, many examples of this. Uh, Jan Holden, who's a professor at the University of North Texas, reviewed more than 100 cases of people who claim to leave their body and to see things from some perspective outside their bodies. And she found that more than 90% of them were entirely accurate. The remaining ones had some inaccuracies. None was totally inaccurate. Um, the number isn't really important because if, if only one experience was accurate, that would pose a problem for the physiological models. But 90% were, more than 90% were. And no matter what physiological model you like, whether it's drugs or a lack of oxygen or temporal lobe stimulation or 
uh, high carbon dioxide, none of those can explain how you can see things from outside your body. What is a cardi- uh, prospective cardiac arrest study, and why are they important in the examination of NDEs? Uh, the, the largest um, prospective cardiac arrest study uh, was done by Sam Parnia, who's uh, in New York. He's originally from uh, England. And what these studies do is uh, they place visual targets um, high in the rooms of high in, in hospital rooms where they can only be seen if you're looking down from the ceiling. And they place these targets in hospital rooms where they think people are likely to have a cardiac arrest. And then the, the idea is that when you have a, one of these patients report a cardiac arrest, you ask them if they saw anything unusual. And you keep prompting them if they saw the target. And ideally in this uh, situation, you would get people reporting accurately uh, the target that was placed. Um, where they couldn't be seen from from the body. Uh, unfortunately, it it hasn't really panned out. Uh, in Parnia's AWARE study, which is what it was called, they ultimately interviewed two thousand more, slightly more than two thousand patients who had cardiac arrests in the hospital. Of those two thousand patients, only nine had any memories of something that sounded at least vaguely like a near death experience. And of those, only two claimed to have left their bodies. And unfortunately, neither one of them had their NDE in a room where the targets had been placed. So there was no evidence from his study about whether people could or couldn't um, see things from outside their bodies. Now, at this point, there have been five studies like that that have been performed. And in all five studies combined, there have been 12 people who reported NDEs. None of them reported seeing the target. I'm not saying that none of that any of them reported the target incorrectly. They did not. They just didn't see the target at all. But that raises the question, why should they? If you are leaving your body during a cardiac arrest, are you going to look around for a target that you didn't even know was there and try to see it and uh, a target that's no relevance to you and then commit it to memory. Uh, when I tell this uh, experimental protocol to near-death experiencers, they generally laugh at it. They say, why would I possibly look for some target? You know, I'm focused on first my body, what's happening with that, and then the other realm. I'm not looking for some target that has no meaning to me. So although the the, the prospective cardiac arrest studies were an intriguing possibility, they really are not uh, practical. Are there any types of studies that you think might be more effective? Well, I'm not sure that you can do um, effective experiments uh, with with um, people because you can't assign them to have a near-death experience or not. Uh, you can't predict when they're going to happen, so you can't really um, measure what's going on physiologically unless uh, it ha- just happens by accident. For example, many people who have cardiac arrests in the hospital are being monitored all the time. So you have incidental data on those folks. Um, but for the most part, we're just left with anecdotal accounts. Um, and we have lots and lots of anecdotes about people who claim to have left their bodies during near-death experiences and reported things accurately, both things around their bodies they shouldn't have seen and also things that were going on at other d- distant locations. One of the more intriguing th- phenomena for me is people who see deceased loved ones in their near-death experience that were not known to have died. And we have dozens and dozens of these cases where someone returned from a near-death experience saying, I saw so-and-so in my near-death experience. And everyone around looks astonished and says, what do you mean? They're, they're still alive. And a day or two later, you find out, no, that person died just before the near-death experience. And I'm not sure how you explain that by a physiological model. That's a tough one for the physiological model. What percentage of NDEs are positive and enjoyable versus frightening? Mm, that's another great question. You know, when, when we first started studying near-death experiences, all we heard were positive ones. 
And then oh, around 1980, um, I was working with a, a woman who had had a frightening one. And she and I together started trying to collect frightening near-death experiences. And it was hard to do because people aren't willing to talk about these things. I mean, it's hard enough to talk about a pleasant near-death experience. It's even harder to talk about an unpleasant one. And we eventually found 50 near-death experiences that were frightening or terrifying or demoralizing, uh, full of despair. And we tried to find what is associated with these um, frightening experiences. Are they associated with different types of coming close to death, different personality traits? And we couldn't find anything. Um, Some had uh, demonic imagery in them. Some just had floating in a black void uh, for what was they thought was going to be eternity. Um, some had things that looked just like pleasant NDEs, but they were experienced in a terrifying way. They found themselves uh, thrust down a tunnel against their will and confronted with a, with a light they didn't want to go to. Um, the same things you see in a pleasant NDE, but it wasn't wasn't experienced in a pleasant way. Interestingly, if you stick with those unpleasant NDEs that look like positive ones, what's unpleasant about them seems to be the resistance that people are showing to this. And many people will say, it was a horrifying experience, and I finally got exhausted and gave up. I stopped fighting, and as soon as I gave up, it became blissful. So it was the resistance that was making it unpleasant. Now, I said we can't really tell how many there are because people aren't willing to talk about these things. There have been a few attempts to estimate um, their frequency, and most estimates are around 5%, but we don't have any good confidence um, in those estimates because we know that it's hard for people to talk about these things. So the instance of unpleasant NDEs is probably higher. Um, It's not the case, we know this, it's not the case that uh, people who lead um, nasty lives, people who are selfish, who are criminals, tend to have unpleasant NDEs. Um, I know some people who are, who are uh, serving life sentences for murder who had blissful NDEs, and I know people who led exemplary lives who had frightening ones. And that shouldn't be surprising because some of our most revered Catholic saints talked about going through a dark night of the soul, so, so we know that spirituality has a positive and a negative side, um, and that it doesn't seem to relate it necessarily to what type of a life you've led. What is found in near-death experiences of individuals who are blind or deaf or who have some other uh, sensory or perceptual deficiency? Yeah. There have been a few studies of this. Um, Kenneth Ring uh, in this country did a study of of people who were were blind, and there was also a study done in Australia. And what they find is that people who are blind, especially those who are blind from birth, um, tend to have NDEs in which they can see. And uh, this, again, argues against a physiological mechanism. If someone doesn't have the visual apparatus in their eyes to see, how can they see things in a near-death experience? And yet some of them do, and some of them report accurately colors of of things. Um, one, one person uh, described the color of someone's tie that they saw in a near-death experience. And this is someone who was blind from birth, had never seen, and presumably didn't even know what vision was. Um, I don't know how to explain these things. Uh, if you don't ever have experience of seeing, how do you know what it is when you do it in a near-death experience? And yet people use that uh that language of a vision to describe what happens at an NDE. Are they really seeing? I, I don't know. I mean, they don't have physical eyes, so it's not seeing the way I'm seeing right now, but they're getting information and processing it in their brains as if it was a vision. What is a shared death experience? Uh, the term shared death experience is another uh, term that, that Raymond Moody came up with, and this occurs when Um, someone is sitting by the bedside of a loved one who is going through an NDE. 
and accompanies them at least partway through the experience. We don't have a lot of reports about these, um, but we do have uh, several dozen of people who um, claim to have gone into the tunnel, sometimes seen the bright light, sometimes seen deceased loved ones, along with the person who was actually having the NDE. And yet, the person having the shared death experience is not at all risk at all at risk for for dying. Um, it's usually a short-lived experience. Uh, at some point in many of these experiences, the person having the NDE actually tells them, you can't go any farther. This is only for me. Uh, interestingly, they, these people who have shared death experiences often have many of the same after effects commonly reported by NDEs. They become much more spiritual, much less materialistic. That leads to a question I was going to ask you, which is about how both NDEs and shared death experiences typically affect those who have them. There's a, there's a wide range of after effects that are typically seen in NDEs. Uh, they have changes in their values, in their attitudes, in their beliefs, in their behavior, and in their subsequent activities. Uh, typically, people um, after an NDE become much more loving, much more compassionate, much more altruistic, um, much more in touch with the spiritual aspect of lives. Um, they also become much less concerned with physical things in life, with money, with power, prestige, uh, rank. Um, they tend to think that there's more of a meaning and purpose to everything that happens in life. Um, they also tend to have uh, a different attitude towards death. And no matter what they thought about death before the NDE, they almost universally come back thinking death is not something to be feared um, or avoided, that death is just a natural part of the life cycle, and it is a transition to another form of life. It's not the end of existence. Uh, there are some other uh, less commonly reported after effects. People often report um, so-called paranormal experiences after the NDE. They may have more examples of telepathy or um, precognition, uh, seeing the future after their NDE. They become more sensitive in general. They often become more sensitive to uh, drugs and alcohol, um, odors. Uh, some of them can't tolerate being around perfumes. Uh, they just become more sensitive to bright lights, to loud noises. They also, because they tend to think that they are not individuals anymore, but part of something larger than themselves, tend to have less respect for interpersonal boundaries, which sometimes gets them into trouble when they become what other people feel is too intrusive. What to? How often are flash forwards experienced in NDEs where people see the future and then that future eventually happens? Yeah, the flash forwards are not that common in um, in near death experiences. They're often experienced as a part of a life review. A person will be going through their lives and then they will realize some of the scenes they're seeing haven't actually happened. And later in their lives, it turns out these were visions of the future that hadn't yet happened. Um, and I have some very dramatic examples of this. Um, some of the more dramatic ones are people who have their NDEs in children, as children, and visualize themselves as adults uh, with families of their own. And then decades later, they are living through a scene and they realize, this is exactly what I was seeing in my near-death experience. Now, sometimes they're very alarming uh, things. Um, one person that I knew had a, a series of flash forwards that included um, a funeral. And when he, decades later, actually was at a funeral, he realized these are the people that I saw in my near-death experience, and they're all standing in the same position. This is what I was seeing. Um, and that was not a pleasant experience for him to realize that this had all been sort of preordained that he was going to have to attend this funeral. So we talked about near-death experiences as a challenge to the materialist paradigm that consciousness is solely a product of brain activity. What other areas of your research or other research that you find compelling 
similarly suggest that consciousness is not solely a product of the brain? Uh, well, one that I've been involved in the last decade or so is what we've called terminal lucidity, because there wasn't a name for it before this. And this occurs in people who have brain diseases that seem to be irreversible. For example, Alzheimer's disease with dementia, um, whose brains are decaying over a period of years and eventually get to the point where they can no longer communicate, they can't speak, they no longer seem to recognize uh, their loved ones, they don't recognize their surroundings, and they just stop interacting at all. And then at some point, they suddenly, without any apparent reason, become alert again and start talking coherently, recognizing people, saying things that make sense, having intact conversations. And then shortly after that, they die. Sometimes it happens minutes before death. Sometimes it's hours. And sometimes it's several days before the person dies. But it's associated with the end of life. Uh, this happens most often with dementia, with Alzheimer's disease. But I've also seen it happen in people who have brain tumors, who have infections in the brain, um, who have a variety of, of brain diseases um, that cause the brain to stop functioning. And then for some reason we can't identify, they suddenly become coherent and lucid again just before they die. Now, that's something that we don't have a materialistic explanation for. If the brain is dying, as in Alzheimer's disease, there's no way we know you can suddenly reverse that process and get those nerve cells back. Um, and yet, somehow, this person has become alert and communicative again, almost as if the brain has decayed enough so that it's knocked out of the way and you can access your mind again. Just the way with psychedelic drugs, what the effects of the drugs is, is to knock out the filter that allows you to access this other world. There are also um, a literature about people who have severe hydrocephalus. This is water on the brain. And people who have severe hydrocephalus, almost their entire skull cavity is taken up by fluid. So there's very little brain tissue left. And yet, many of these people have normal IQs and normal functioning. Um, there was a British uh, child psychiatrist, John Lorber, who published many of these cases. Um, and he described one case in very great detail. This is a graduate student in mathematics, uh, Cambridge University, who had a high IQ. He was married. He had a normal life. And he came to see the doctors because he had some hormonal problem. And as part of the workup, they did a brain scan and found he had almost no brain at all. His entire head was filled up with fluid. There's a very, very thin layer of brain cells on the outside of his skull. Uh, and there was no explanation for this. You know, how can you have a normal functioning person, and in this case, a high functioning person, with almost no brain tissue? There are other cases of people who had been born without one half of the brain, or who had um, one or more lobes of the brain surgically removed for one reason or another, and yet they continue to function perfectly normally without that. So there are a lot of questions about the relationship of brain and mind, if in some cases you can see seem to do quite well without it. Uh, that, that doesn't happen in all cases. In fact, going back to terminal lucidity, most people who have Alzheimer's disease die still not communicating. It's rare that people become alert and lucid before death. But the fact that it happens at all is something we just can't explain. Is there a model of reality that can accommodate these various phenomena that you find compelling? Or are there any emerging theories that can explain these things? Um, yes, there are, there are a number of emerging theories. Um, I can't say that any one is particularly compelling for me. Um, there is a book called Beyond Physicalism uh, that was edited by Ed Kelly, Adam Crabtree, and Paul Marshall. And this is the product of many, many years of a group meeting um, to talk about brain and mind issues. And they finally came up with this book that has about a dozen different models to explain uh, 
brain and mind functioning separately. And some of these come from physics, either from quantum physics or hyperdimensional physics. Some come from psychology. Some come from religious traditions. But there are a variety of models that can accommodate brain and mind functioning independently. Now, obviously, brain and mind relate in some ways. When you get drunk, you usually don't think very well. When you get hit on the head, that usually makes you confused. So the brain has something to do with the mind, but it's not irreversibly linked to it because there are times when the brain stops functioning, when the mind continues to function, in some cases, better than ever. <clears throat> now, I don't, I don't think, I don't find any one of these models particularly compelling because I think they all have problems. Um, you know, one way around the, uh, the physiological problem is to say that the physical world doesn't really exist, that everything is mental. And the, what we think of the physical world is just a mental construction. This is kind of the flip side of materialism where you think, well, everything in the mental world is a construction of the physical. And we know that doesn't work because there are times when the physical doesn't function and the mind does quite well. But you flip around and say that the only thing that exists is the mind and that what we think of as the physical world is just an imagination of the mind. I don't find that particularly compelling, uh, but that's becoming more and more popular among some neuroscientists. Um, there are also various models of how mind, how the physical and the mental can relate to each other uh, in ways that aren't causal, that where one is not causing the other. For example, if they're, as an analogy, flip sides of the same coin, um, or they are different ways of describing the same underlying uh, one phenomenon. Uh, one way of describing this with mental words, another with physical words. Uh, I'm not a philosopher. I'm a scientist, and when you get into these realms of philosophy, I sort of lose my my thoughts and think, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense to me. And I think that's where I'm left, that none of the models that have been proposed really make any sense to me. And that includes the physical model as well as the other models. Uh, we just don't have an explanation as far as I can see. What is mediumship, and to what extent has that come into your research? Mediums are people who claim to be able to communicate with uh, deceased people. Um, now, th I haven't done a lot of research on, on mediumship. Um, the history of mediumship is kind of checkered because there are some people who obviously have been fraudulent and just um, pretended to be able to contact the dead using a variety of, of tricks to, to fool people. But there have been some... Um, controlled experiments with mediumship, including one at the University of Virginia where I work, uh, that are controlled for that type of thing. And they have found that there are some mediums who can come back with accurate information that nobody except the deceased person and someone who knew them quite well could have known. Um, now, I want to contrast mediumship, which involves unusual people who claim to have, be able to make contact with apparitions of the deceased that happen to just anybody, as happens in an Indian death experience, where anybody having one of these experiences um, can come into contact with deceased loved ones. Um, that we have a lot more evidence for, and that doesn't seem to be the case where, where some of those are are fraudulent because there's no there's no motive for that. Uh, there are several labs now in this country, um, and some in the UK, that are doing experiments with mediums. Um, and as you might imagine, the difficult part of that is maintaining control over the experimental setup. Ideally, you would want the medium and the person wanting to contact the deceased loved one not to be in contact with each other so that you rule out any possibility of the medium reading cues, nonverbal cues from the other person. Uh, we try to do that, but mediums almost universally say, the more contact I have with the person, 
um, the easier it is to contact the deceased loved one, which makes sense, but it makes it hard to do research on it. Children who remember previous lives, so there's been a lot of work done at the University of Virginia. What is your opinion on that line of research, and what are some of the most compelling cases? Yeah, We, we have about uh, 2,500 cases now of young children, um, usually three, four, or five years old, who spontaneously start talking about a past life. And they will start innocently saying something like, um, you know, my other mother doesn't cook like this. Um, or they may start having um, unusual fears of something that doesn't make sense. Like they may be suddenly afraid of water. Um, and as you talk to them more and more, a story comes out about it. For example, with a person afraid of water, he may report having drowned in a past life. And these are very young children, uh, usually preschool age, uh, who aren't prompted, but just sort of spontaneously start talking about these things. Uh, at the University of Virginia, we have only studied young children um, and only those who have uh, these memories coming up spontaneously. We do not study adults and we do not study people whose memories come back under hypnosis, not because those are necessarily um, fraudulent, but because it's hard for us to rule out uh, fraud or uh, self-fraud. For example, with adults, um, we're exposed to so much about other cultures and other times that it's easy to imagine or making up another life, whereas a child of three years old doesn't have that familiarity with other lives, other cultures to make up a coherent story. The key to all this in terms of the research is that in many of these cases, we, the child gives enough detail that we can actually track down who they claim to have been in a past life and verify that the information is accurate. And in many of the better cases, we can take the child to the place they claim to have lived in a past, past life. And usually it's someone they, someplace they've never been in this life. And they accurately show you around the, the city, uh, tell you what's changed since they lived there last, um, and identify people uh, that they have never seen before in this life. In some of these cases, we've taken them to meet the family of the person they claim to have been in the past life. And they know so many intimate details of the family life that the surviving family members come to accept that this really is their loved one who's been reborn. Again, this raises some serious problems for the physical model, the physiological model of mind and brain, because nothing is transferred physically from the past life to this life, and yet the information is. And it's not just information. It's emotions and desires. For example, we have uh, people who claim to have been of a different gender in the past life, men who claim to have been a woman in the past life and vice versa. And they may act out in their childhood, age two, three, four, as if they were of the other gender. Um, we have people who, are, when we take them back to the town they lived in before, get very angry about things that have changed in the house they used to live in because they didn't want them to change. Um, and we also have people who feel who, these little children who feel loving feelings for the family of the person they claim to have been in the past life. So it's not just the cognitive memories, it's also the emotions that are appropriate that go with it. And again, very hard to explain in terms of the physiological model. To what extent has the phenomenon of channeling been studied at the University of Virginia? Uh, it, it really hasn't. Um, in a sense, mediumship is a form of channeling. Uh, channeling implies contacting some other entities. When that other entity is a deceased person, that's really mediumship. But some channels claim to um, communicate with other entities besides uh, deceased humans. Uh, and we haven't looked at that at all. And other phenomena 
like psychic phenomena such as telepathy or remote viewing or precognition or even psychokinesis. To what extent has the University of Virginia looked at those phenomena? Uh, we have on and off over the years. Um, we've done some experiments with uh, telepathy, with uh, clairvoyance. Um, we have a uh, an EEG lab in our facility um, where we can measure what's going on in someone's brain while they're having a certain experience. And we've done studies, for example, where we had um, an emotionally bonded pair like uh, two siblings or a husband and wife or a mother or daughter. And one will be in one building looking at a picture that's either um, or, or that's arousing in some way, either very pleasant or very erotic or very violent. And meanwhile, the other pair of that, the other person in that pair will be in our lab hooked up to an EEG. So we're measuring what's going on in their brains and they are experiencing uh, what their partner is watching, was looking at in the, in the picture. And they usually give accurate emotional responses to the picture that's being watched. Um, we've also done a lot of research with psychokinesis, uh, mind over matter in various ways, with people who can seem to bend metal without touching it. Um, we have, again, used the EEG lab to measure what's going on in the brains of people when they w are doing this. Uh, we've also looked at people who are being so-called psychically healed um, and what's going on in their brains when that's going on. And what is happening in their brains versus a, a normal brain that's not attempting to do these things? Uh, I can't give you a simple answer to that. Um, it's very, very complicated trying to analyze EEGs, and we are still um, at the very early stages of this. Uh, in addition to measuring the EEG, we're looking at other imaging techniques, uh, fMRIs, and, and now something something has come out newer that's... Um, a functional near infrared spectroscopy. Um, and these are different ways of imaging the brain. The EEG, which measures brain waves, tells you what's going on instant by instant. But the electricity you're measuring, um, it's hard to localize exactly where in the brain that's coming from. On the other hand, with a visual imaging technique like an fMRI or the near infrared spectroscopy, you get the exact location in the brain that the signal is coming from, but it's averaged over several seconds. You can't get both without using, without combining techniques. So when we combine the EEG, measuring brain waves, with the optical imaging techniques, we get both the location in time and the location in space. And we're starting to do that now with selected individuals who can do um, certain things uh, at will, like leaving their bodies or having other experiences. The, uh, the major difficulty with, with these techniques is we have to find people who can do it at will. And often these are experiences that happen to people unbidden without, uh, without any way of predicting it. What do you think is the strongest evidence that metal can be bent using the mind alone? Uh, well, we, we've seen it happen uh, time and again. Um, now, I know there are uh, ways that stage magicians can mimic this, but there are ways of making sure that the person is not anywhere near the object that is uh, being bent. We've also started to look at the uh, microscopic structure of the metal that's bent um, and looking at whether it's more similar to a deformity that's been made by physically bending it or by heating it and we're not finding evidence now that really suggests how these things are being bent. Um, more intriguing is that this can also happen with non-metallic structures, with glass and with wood, wood, which are uh, totally different structures and suggest that there's not one simple mechanism for this to happen. In terms of your own research, what are you most excited about going forward? And beyond your personal research, what areas do you think um, deserve the most study or are you very excited about? Well, I am a, a clinical psychiatrist and I have made my living with the past half century by helping people deal with their personal issues. So for me, the most interesting part of the near-death experience has always been how it affects people, how it changes their attitudes and beliefs and values. 
Uh, now, that may be the, not be the most exciting um, part of it for other people, but for me, um, I do find that exciting. You know, psychiatrists and psychologists have to work very hard for long periods of time to make fairly small changes in people's attitudes. And yet, here comes a near-death experience, and in the blink of an eye, can totally transform someone's personality and attitudes and beliefs. That's a power that we don't have. And it speaks to this being more than just a hallucination. People don't change their lives because of a hallucination. This is a powerful spiritual experience. Now, having said that, I realize that what's important to me is not what's important to other people necessarily. And I think for humanity in general, the most important part of this feature of the near-death experience and similar experiences is what it tells us about the mind and the brain. Uh, as I said before, we don't really have an explanation for these things. The explanation certainly is not that the mind is being created by the brain. Um, that's the way most people here still think about things. Um, but it's obviously it doesn't, it doesn't uh, explain the phenomena we're looking at. So I think we need to put more effort into, ha into explaining how can these things happen? How can you have the mind functioning when the brain is not? And that may tell us a lot more about how the world functions. Um, you know, I, I always think that uh, science makes the most progress when it studies things we don't understand. You know, when you study things that we do understand, what you get is a better, uh, more detail about how they work. But when you study phenomena that are not well understood, like NDEs, that's where you have the potential for making great breakthroughs in science. And how we understand the world. It reminds me a lot of Lord Kelvin's statement around 1900 when he said that most of physics had been discovered, but there were two clouds that were not well understood, and those clouds turned into quantum mechanics and general relativity. Exactly. Yeah. Time after time, people have said, oh, we know it all now, and then shortly after that, the whole world was turned upside down by some new discoveries. Yeah, I think we're at that point. Thank you for all the research that you've done. I think it's incredibly important. So I'm, I'm very happy that we had a chance to talk, and I think this will be uh, illuminating for many people. My pleasure, Mark. Thanks for listening to another full-length interview from my podcast, Where Is My Mind? I hope you enjoyed it. Check out the show notes at markgober.com slash podcast for more information on the guests I've interviewed. Also, don't forget to check out the show, which features clips from many of these interviews on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please tell your friends. This has been Mark Gober, and thanks for your support.